Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and welcome to our Parsha Pinchas. This week's sermon is titled, Hashem, our God, make me zealous for you. So we're going to learn from his zealous servants in the Bible. We all know that the Midrash tells us that uh, Pinchas, the title, character, of this parasha and Elihau, the prophet of kings, are one and the same. In this week's parasha video, Rabbi Arel Fry compares these two characters and asks, what does it mean to be zealous for Hashem, our God? So to learn about the original act of uh, zealotry, watch our parasha Kitisa. Uh, and also the Eliyahu story videos on our Parashot archive on our website. Amen. So Shabbat Shalom to all of you and uh, be blessed. Thank you, Rebbe Tzin Gabriela. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. And uh, as Gabriela said this week, as we're talking about the parasha, uh, Pinchas, and being zealous for, for God, for Hashem. So I want to talk to you this week about zealotry and also taking matters into our own hands, doing things to uphold the honor of Hashem, of God, that Hashem had not, himself not commanded. So let's talk about who were these servants defined as great zealots in the Bible. Pinchas is killing flagrant offenders. Zimri, who is a highly placed fish, Jewish official, Israeli official, who commits an inexcusable act of public intimacy with a Midianite woman by the name of Cosby. <clears throat> and it's a time when, in general, the Jews are being seduced towards idolatry and towards uh, licentiousness with the daughters of Midian. The master of the universe, Hashem, expresses a great amount of anger and everything is falling apart. The leaders, who have allowed this to happen need to be killed. All right, that's what he wants. He says, kill them. Hashem says that in the breach, Pinchas acts and killing Zimri and Cosby in the moment. Okay? The leaders need to be killed. So he kills this guy, Zimri, and this woman, Cosby. No one commanded him to do it. He did it on his own. And the aftermath of that act, we are told about the rewards, so to speak, that Pinchas is given by Hashem, by God. Hineni noten lo et briti shalom. I am giving, going to give Pinchas my covenant. <clears throat> okay, briti is a covenant. And I am going to give him peace, shalom. <laughs> Pinchas act, and Pinchas's act was violent, and of all things, he gets a covenant of peace for it. He was involved in the opposite of what we would call peace. We might try to kind of wiggle our way out of this by saying that, well, his act was a violent act and Hashem was sort of opposed to it. So it was kind of a chastisement of Pinchas in a way, but this doesn't seem to be the plain sense of the verse, okay? Hashem seems to be very happy, very, very happy, in fact, with what Pinchas did. And why of all things is Hashem giving him a covenant of peace? Now, I would like to start by pointing out that there was another great zealot portrayed in the Bible, and it is Elijah the prophet. In uh, Hebrew, it's Eliyahu. Interestingly, our sages tell us that Eliyahu and Pinchas were actually the same person. Okay, I never read that myself, so I doubt it. Whether they mean that Pinchas never died or that he was reincarnated or was just they shared the same kind of central spirit, I cannot tell you, but these two people seem to be great zealots in biblical narrative. So let's look at Eliyahu or Elijah. Eliyahu acts with zeal on behalf of Hashem, right when we first meet him, and in many ways of circumstances that those times were similar to those of Pinchas. In response to the mass idolatry at the time, uh, at the time period, he unilaterally acting on his own, proclaimed the drought and does this to uphold Hashem's honor. The honor of Hashem has been debased, all right? 
So our sages, in explanation of Eliyahu's actions, uh, tell a story of a, com a conversation in which Ahab, the king of Israel at the time of Eliyahu, tells him that he doesn't understand. Hashem promises in Deuteronomy that if the Jews or the Israelites worship idolatry, there won't be rain in the land. But there's a plentiful rain. At which point Eliyahu stands up for the honor of Hashem and says, no, by the life of Hashem, there won't be any more rain. And there's no more rain. Eliyahu was the other great zealot in the Bible. <clears throat> now let's talk about the differences between the Bible's zealous characters. So, strangely, Hashem treats Eliyahu very differently than he treats Pinchas. <laughs> Whereas Pinchas seems to meet with nothing but approval, it is a questionable, questionable whether that's so with Eliyahu. Okay, now it is true. God goes along with the drought. There is no rain once Eliyahu, Eliyahu declares, uh, declares that there will be no rain, but ultimately Hashem puts an end to it. Here comes a time when Hashem says, Eliyahu, there's got to be rain. And after that, the rain comes. Eliyahu goes on a strange journey to Mount Kuri, otherwise known as Mount Sinai, and a journey where he doesn't eat and he doesn't drink for 40 days and 40 nights. <clears throat> now, there was another person, as we know, who has spent 40 days and 40 nights on uh, Mount Sinai without packing lunch before the end, right? Now, it seems like Eliyahu is kind of copying Moshe's or Moses' experience. Why would he do this? That's a good question, and we will come back to that in just a moment. But in this re reprise of Moshe's experience at Sinai, Hashem comes to Eliyahu and asks what he's doing there. Why he came to the mountain. And here's the answer. He says, Kanu kineti la Hashem eloke tibaut. <clears throat> okay, I have acted jealously on behalf of Hashem, the Lord. Okay? He adzvu beritecha, left behind your covenant, Hashem. Okay. Or the people left behind your covenant. And then strangely, Hashem asks Eliyahu again, what are you doing here, Eliyahu? And Eliyahu answers the same thing again. And the next thing Hashem says, it's time for your retirement. Of course, if you remember well, Eliyahu or Elijah had also said, I can't take it anymore, God. Please, I'm finished. Okay, so, Bet Elisha ben Shaphat me'avad me'chola timoshach l'nabi tachtecha. And Elisha, he will be the next prophet after you. <clears throat> so, Elijah says, hey, I'm tired. I can't take this anymore. And I've done all I can. I've acted zealously. And so, Hashem says, Elisha will be the one to follow you. Now, why is Eliyahu being retired, and why did he go? Anyway, so what was he doing, or why did he go to Mount Sinai? What was he doing at Mount Sinai? So I would like to suggest a possible answer here, and the, pos and the answer really comes down to two words that Eliyahu said. They're spelled exactly the same way as the two words that the Torah uses in respect to Pinchas. Kano kineti. I have acted jealously. Those same letters appear with respect to Pinchas. Hashem says, commenting on Pinchas' act, that he acted wonderfully. Bekano et kinati, in expressing my jealousy. The word kana can mean either <clears throat> zeal or jealousy. Okay, depending on the context. So it is fascinating, and it's exactly the same words, just put differently. Okay, maybe that indeed was some, has something to do with why our sages say that Pinchas and Eli, Eliyahu, expressions of the same core energy, but the key perhaps to understanding the differences between these two men, why are they held, with so, uh, held so differently by Hashem, <clears throat> may lie in the transition or the transformation of the words Bekano et Kinati to Kano Kinati. Okay, so indeed, these two different expressions of the same Hebrew consonants may neatly summarize for us the differences between Pinchas and Eliyahu. So I will explain it this way, by 
getting back to the question about Eli Elijah or Eliyahu was doing at Mount Sinai to begin with. So let's speak of the first act of zealotry in the Bible. Sinai is the very first act of zealotry. Uh, that ever took place within Jewish history. At that moment that the Torah was being revealed, because at that moment there was an act of idolatry too. The Jews were worshiping the golden calf, and in that moment an act took place which would define forever uh, more the parameters of kina, or of human action expressing divine jealousy. Here's the back room, uh, background, I'm sorry, not the back room. <laughs> <laughs> the words Lechred Hashem says to Moshe, go down the mountain. Ki shichet amcha, your people have sinned. <laughs> I love it. And Moshe responds, what do you mean? My people have corrupted. They aren't my people, it's your people. You took them out of Egypt. And anyway, Hashem, lama Hashem afecha beamecha. Why should you be angry with your people? Now that seems to be kind of an outrageous thing to say. The people are dancing around the calf. And Moshe has a tem, uh, the tenacity or the, the audacity, he would say, to say, you can't get angry. Okay? <laughs> we discussed this back in the Parashah Kitisa. And I will refer you to that teaching for more extended discussion of this. But the next thing that happens <clears throat> is really incredible. Here's Moshe, Moses, who had just the courage to tell the master of the universe, the creator, that you can't be angry. And the next thing that happens is Moshe goes down the mountain, goes down the mountain. He sees the calf, and the very next thing, words are, Be'echar af Moshe, and Moshe became angry. He just told Hashem that anger isn't appropriate. <laughs> so why are you getting angry for? So, Moshe then takes the two luchot, which are the, the, the the commandments, the tablets that were in his hands and smashes them at the foot of the mountain. Now, did Hashem tell him to do it? No. He's acting by himself, all right? Independently. He is taking tablets that Hashem, God himself, had crafted. He's taking this incredible gift and he's breaking it, smashing it on his own without being told to do so by Hashem. Now, I would like to suggest that uh, paradigmatic act of kina, okay, of zealousy, of human expression of divine anger, and the subsequent acts of both Pinchas and Elijah, or Eliyahu, derive in some way from almost different interpretations of this act. It is as if that fundamental act at Mount Sinai was a touchstone for both Pinchas and Eliyahu. Indeed, it was the, the Ten Commandments itself that which was given at top of the mountain on these 40 days and 40 nights, <clears throat> that God first declared himself Kel Kane, or a jealous God. Okay. A jealous Hashem. So, Hashem who will not abide by idolatry. Now, Moshe now expresses that jealousy, and in a way, that expression of jealousy becomes a precedent for both of the acts of Pinchas and the act of Eliyahu, depending on how you interpret the golden calf itself. So here is how Eliyahu, the man who went back to Mount Sinai, might have interpreted it. Moshe did something that he was not commanded to do. He led and Hashem followed. He independently destroyed the tablets, and I, Eliyahu, I independently declare this drought. Okay. I am defending Hashem's honor, God's honor, as just as Moshe did. Okay. That's one way we could look at it. But there's another way to see it also. It is a way that we might argue that is suggested by Pinchas. In the aftermath of the golden calf episode, Hashem stood ready to destroy the entire people, just as he stood ready to destroy the leaders at the time of Pinchas. Lech red, he told Moshe, go down. karaga, I will destroy them in an instant. Now Moshe tells Hashem, you must not be angry with them. Then Moshe goes down the mountain and Moshe is angry. 
It is not an act of hypocrisy. It makes perfect sense if we see it in just a moment. So what does it mean to be zealous for Hashem or for God? What Moshe was telling Hashem is, of course, anger is, not, is wanted here, but you cannot be angry. I can be angry. Leave your anger to me. So Moshe knew something very, very deep. Moshe was a partner, as, it, as so to speak, as it were, a human partner with the divine in taking the Jews, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, when it's all gone wrong, Hashem and Moshe's mutual offspring, as it were, the Israelites were worshiping a calf at the bottom of the mountain when they should have been standing ready to accept the Torah. It was the moment when anger on part of the divine couldn't be avoided. The question is, how would that anger be expressed? Now, I'm going to give you a kind of an analogy. Imagine a mother and father have a child, and the child commits a shockingly horrible, egregious, upfront uh, <clears throat> thing against both of them, okay? Imagine that in this relationship, one of the spouses is more powerful than the other. Obviously, the father. Let's say the father is for the moment. The father heads to the child's room. The mother knows the power of the father's anger and fears for the child. So she heads off the father and says to him, she says, let me handle this. Let me express her anger on behalf of both of us. All right? So the mother and father are a unit. One can act on behalf of the other. I remember this happened many times when I was a child. Okay. Maybe if I did something wrong and my mom was angry, my dad would deal with me. There was times when my mom dealt with me by herself. It depended on the moment. <clears throat> Mother's anger can be on behalf of both of them, but the mother's anger in this case would be safer. Mother knows that in order for this plan to be effective, she has to generally be as angry as possibly can, as she possibly can. Moshe knows that he has to be as angry as he possibly can be. He convinces Hashem, so to speak, do not think this is a legitimate expression of anger. Look at what I have done. I've done it to your tablets, I have smashed them in, on the mountain. I am outraged, but my outrage is much safer. You are the master of the universe. You are the infinite Hashem. You are the infinite God. Infinite power is a dangerous thing when it comes to poor mortal human beings. Let me express your anger. And because Moshe acted this way, peace was achieved. Instead of destroying all the people, he destroyed the two tablets in an animate object. And the people lived. So, let's divine good and bad zealotry in the Bible. There are two kinds of zealotry. One is Eliyahu's, but Eliyahu's did not come in a moment when Hashem had decreed destruction upon the people. It was Eliyahu standing up with, that he, with what he perceived was the honor of Hashem to be. That's Kino Kineti. I acted jealously on Hashem's behalf. Hashem ultimately retires Eliyahu, like I said. Eliyahu had also expressed the fact that he was tired and couldn't take it anymore. So jealousy, that is fundamentally a human being's jealousy, even in the divine interest, Hashem has limited tolerance for. But there's another type of zealotry that Hashem will not put aside, will not retire, that Hashem loves abundantly, a kind of zealotry that ironically brings peace. And that's an attempt to save. So it is not when you stand up for what you think Hashem's honor is, it is Bekano Ekinati. It's the zeal of Pinkas, who in turn or learned from Moshe what it means to feel that jealousy of Hashem. This kind of jealousy is not initiated by a human being, it is shared by a human. That kind of anger is, in fact, ironically an act of peace. It is the decision of the weaker partner to fully express the anger of the stronger one because it's the only safe thing that can be done. Instead of killing all the leaders, he killed the one and the lady that he was with. It is the only way that peace can actually be preserved. So Pinchas kills Zimri and Cosby, but does this to save everyone else, like I said, the other leaders. He expresses divine anger genuinely, but in its weakest form. And in doing so, he brings peace to the nation and a covenant of peace to himself forever. So thank you for joining me today. I now want to invite the Rebetzin Gabriela to come and uh, uh, tell us a little more and to close with a word of prayer. Toda Rabba, 
uh, Rabbi Arel for this marvelous sermon we have been listening to. And uh, we all know that it's very difficult to understand Hashem, our God's mercy and justice. And His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As we come at His presence and seek Him only, placing our lives in His hands, we find shalom, peace. Just like being hasted, we can ask to be zealous for him, like Pinchas did and Elihau, the prophet, and walk in his ways, walk in his path, which are not ours. Let's pray together for the redemption of the people of Israel in the Mashiach, Yeshua, the Mashiach of Israel. Amen. Let's pray first in Hebrew and then in uh, English. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Ederek HaYeshua B'Meshiach Yeshua Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. And if you have prayed this prayer with all of your heart, with all of your might, with all of your soul, please contact us via email, uh, through the website, through the social media, and the uh, messenger. We are always available for prayer, and um, we want to pray for you. May Hashem bless you. And uh, we have also a gift for you that is a powerful uh, testimony of faith in Yeshua or one of the Messianic Jews of our friends that is called uh, Isaiah 53 explained and it's a very uh, beautiful book that we want to give you as our gift to you from Hashem. Amen. And now I'm going to invite uh, the Rabbi Erel to come and pray for us and uh, pray the ironic blessings. Shabbat shalom to all of you. Thank you, Rebbe Tzin Gabriela, for that beautiful prayer. Now, I'd just like to give the ironic blessing before we close. Yivarechecha Adonai Vishmarecha. Yair Adonai Panavalecha Vichuneka. Yisa Adonai Panavalecha Vishim Lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to all of you.